Thanks again for, for the introduction. Um, title of the talk today is, is called Relational Technology, uh, Community-Led Indigenous Language Reclamation and Revitalization. Um, just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll start with positionality and self-location, um, starting with myself. Um, and these are just leading into bigger questions about enacting relational technology, i.e. who are you and who is benefiting from technology in the process. Um, I'll then introduce the role of technology for indigenous language revitalization and how that differs for dominant languages um, and the, the context for indigenous languages and what that means. Um, I'll then focus in on digital and online technologies during the web 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 eras um, with some key takeaways from each. And then I'll round off with some concluding thoughts and remarks and some questions for you all to maybe even talk about when, when, when um, at the end or to just carry forward as a prompt for further discussion. So uh, without further ado then, who am I? Um Mr. Paul Meechan Shiblo. Paul Mac Angusina Dolik Anush Lisbik Ikanush Ikion. Um Shegel Ahanam Lugak Agus Hokami on an Glasuhu on an Alaba Agus Shinyak Bransuhi Ahanam on a McGill University Montreal Agus Isma Ur Konyhu. So I introduce myself in uh, my language, uh, Scottish Gaelic. Um, my name is Paul Megan Chiblo. Um, I introduce myself in relation to my, my Gaelic family and community uh, from Dalibra in South Uist, or Uist de Jace, um, and my mother there, Paul Mac Angusina. So my mother's name is Angusina. I'm a Scottish Gael. I was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland, and I'm a PhD candidate in educational studies at McGill University in Montreal. Um, and it's very nice to be talking with you all today. Um, so where am I? I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land where I'm delivering this virtual presentation, the plants, the water, the animals and spirits. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land and territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, I'd just like to say I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on these lands. Um, some research reasons behind my research. Why am I doing this? Like I said in the, the introduction, um, who are you self-locating yourself and positioning yourself for any research work is crucial, particularly when we're talking about work with indigenous and or minoritized communities. So in my own personal experience, um, like I mentioned before, I grew up in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, my language, Scottish Gaelic, was not available to me in the educational system. Um, however, I can speak Spanish, French, Italian uh, fluently um, from starting with those languages, I guess, in primary school and also living in those countries in Europe as well. I've, I've lived for a couple of years in Spain, a couple of years in Italy. Japan, now over here in Turtle Island. However, my language was not available to me. And members of my family recall being, being beaten for speaking the language in school. Um, so that's a living memory, a tangible memory uh, as well. And since meeting and marrying my Anishinaabe Ojibwe husband, we met and married in 2015, we met in Glasgow. I have learned more about the harms of colonization on the indigenous peoples and indigenous languages of Turtle Island, or what is now known as North and Central America. So these discussions, my own personal experiences, having discussions with my Anishinaabe family, um, have driven me to envisage and enact more e equitable education and language education policy. Um, my research focuses on Indigenous language revitalization and language educational policy. And more specifically, my doctoral work focuses on intersections between technology, indigenous languages, and traditional ecological knowledge. So this paper that I'm going to be discussing has been published in Alternative uh, Journal, um, and I believe um, Inga shared the link for that as well. So I'm going to be looking at this. It's a review of what has been done um, since 
the emergence of digital and online technologies with the World Wide Web in 1989. So an introduction, with the advance of dominant world colonial worldviews and colonial languages, indigenous languages continue to be threatened and endangered. Um, resources are limited uh, for indigenous languages and what I mean, I don't mean resources as in uh, a very strict limited sense. What I mean by that is there is um, a lack of, let's say, support for indigenous language reclamation and revitalization initiatives. There are relatively few uh, speakers and elder speakers who are fluent to transmit the language on. And there are also bureaucratic red tape hurdles, i.e. external standards to become qualified or accredited to quote unquote teach languages. So there's a lot of red tape bureaucracy behind the scenes there too. And funding is un unnecessarily difficult to access as well. And in addition to this, Western pedagogies or those pedagogies designed from outside or external, external resources, external materials may not meet the needs of the local indigenous communities. One common goal for indigenous language revitalization initiatives is inter intergenerational language transmission and use in the home contexts. Could the use of technology assist in this process for indigenous language revitalization? But First of all, how, well, the bigger question is how could technology assist, but how do we define technology and its role? So technology is not just machines. It may just come, some people may conceive of technology as being futuristic or just machines. However, that is not the case. Technology is a result of practical applied knowledge, skills and networks that are constantly evolving and also context dependent. What I mean by this is technology is not neutral and is the extension of the knowledge system that has led to its creation. And some examples of this um, over centuries include writing systems such as pictographs, uh, the wampum belt, the pencil, mass media, television, and more recently, th this is the focus of the talk today, uh, online and digital technologies such as internet and cell phones. So like I mentioned before, a technology is an extension of a knowledge system or a belief system. A fundamental issue then to consider for the role of technology is which or whose knowledge system is actually being enacted. Who created the website? Who created the app? What is its purpose? How is the data being shared or stored online? And who is doing the quote unquote research? who is benefiting from the research, who's getting access to funds, grants, profits, and are those monies that are being generated, how are, the, are those empowering the community? Are they being given back to the community to drive up community capacity? So these questions are crucial for indigenous languages and cultures that have been already disprivileged and disenfranchised by imperialistic, capitalistic, and or colonial knowledge systems. So for this paper, um, like I said before, it's a review of everything. Well, not everything, it's non-exhaustive, but it's a review of what has been happening in the digital landscape since 1989. And I took a decolonizing approach to this informed by indigenous research methodologies and epistemologies. So what this means is positioning yourself, understanding your self-location, why you're doing your research, what's your motivation, your intent, how you position yourself in relation to the work you're doing is crucial to build trust with the communities you're working with and also to be transparent in the process going forward for ethical research practice. So more specifically in terms of collating quote unquote the data, um, I wanted to decenter search results determined by colonial or western library knowledge organization systems and what i mean by this is sometimes when you go into let's say a, a library management or organization system indigenous knowledges and expertise can be classified not only viewed as quote unquote folklore which isn't the case which is very dismissive of indigenous knowledge systems as well so what I decided to do was to do citation and reference list snowballing in addition to using 
uh, knowledge organization systems. What I mean by this is by consulting indigenous scholarship, I would check the reference list and I would go from there and use citation and reference list snowballing to locate appropriate and culturally relevant um, materials to inform this work. So here is a table from the manuscript that I mentioned where I it's non exhaustive it's purely for illustrative purposes, but where I kind of give an overview of the types and stages of technology from facilitation to communication technologies and then more recently focus sorry more present day use of digital and online technologies um, and then, of course, looking at semantic technologies in the future. Um, I also wanted to focus in on the relationship between these types and stages and who is doing the work and how is it co-creation of knowledge? Are the community members being involved? Um, and then some examples here. So I'm going to focus now on digital and online technologies situating the web 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 eras. This is important because the World Wide Web was created in 1989, but there has been a strong influence of a dominant Western capitalistic worldview. What I mean by this is Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, envisaged quote unquote universality and the monolingual, i.e. English design of the web here. So we can see here that the, the origin origination of the landscape was very much embedded in a Western, i.e. English, monocultural viewpoint. However, the web is not monolithic, nor linear, and is still evolving. And the notions of web 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, and I'll give more examples of this, Although these are important, um, citing Barassi and Trere here, although they're important when analyzing the political economy of the web, they do have limitations and are cultural constructs influenced by Western business, i.e. capitalist rhetoric. So the relationship and evolution of technology is crucial for a more holistic and nuanced assessment of technology's social impact on indigenous language revitalization. Is there a relationship being built? Um, who is doing the work, like I mentioned before? The continue evolving internet or web is a complex social technical environment with multiple uses dependent on these social contexts and the relationships involved. So I'm gonna focus in now on the web 1.0 era from 1989 to 2005. Again, this is an approximate um, time frame here. So, this was characterized by the new World Wide Web, digital technologies, and um, we may all be familiar with this when it when the Internet and the World Wide Web first came about. Um, it was characterized by desktop computer, CD-ROMs, things like that, and dial-up connection. I don't know if you remember, it used to, when you connect to the Internet, it used to have that ringing sound. I certainly do. I was still at school when it came, when the, we had access to the web. Um, for indigenous language of revitalization, one of the first initiatives was Te Wahapu, or the estuary. And this is a computer-based communication system created in 1990 and focused on the revitalization of the Maori language um, in New Zealand. What this communication system symbolized was integration of high technology with Maori concerns and interests, and also to convey the message that English does not have a monopoly when it comes to making use of advanced technology. So kind of get going against that universality that Tim Berners-Lee envisaged and using the technology to be more culturally rooted and responsive. Um, some more examples here, spoken and written dictionaries with audio and video recordings of elders, indigenous elders speaking their languages. Um, example of this is First Voices. Um, if you type that in, www.firstvoices.com, I think it is. I, I have the website, I'll show it later as well. They have examples of spoken and written dictionaries to this day, and it first came about in this era. There was also interactive CD-ROMs and other types of multimedia. Um, so here are bilingual CD-ROM in English and Yupik in Alaska, a uh, database in uh, Tinglet with a talking map and historical info in English and Tinglet, and in Central California, 
um, a CD-ROM in mono um, with traditional and contemporary verbal arts performances. Um, some other examples more globally include a modern day television soap opera in Scottish Gaelic and a CD-ROM about ice hockey in Ojibwe. Some key takeaways and insights from this uh, era then. It was important because these technology enable initiatives enabled indigenous communities to quote, cut out the middle people and speak directly to their audience. However, information on indigenous languages, uh, cultures and communities were largely placed online by a group community or state, the nation state, without the broader input of those who were actually using the materials. So there was a lack of co-creation of knowledge or user input on the material development. And many of the initiatives were examples of quote unquote low tech projects where it was just click and you would receive. The, the, the user was very much a passive recipient. Some other uh, takeaways and insights, Buzzard Welcher finds that 38% of the 50 sites on Native American or Canadian indigenous languages belonged to groups and only four of those 50 were created by a quote unquote tribal member or official organization themselves. Some CD-ROMs also lacked cultural context, such as in the case of the Yupik language and culture. What I mean by that is a direct translation into English without giving more broader insights into the place-based knowledge about um, plant knowledge, medicine knowledge, things like that. Um, and like I said here, for instance, indigenous words were not given with a literal or faithful translation with valuable ecological knowledge. Much of the material didn't go beyond words or phrases. Um, much of it was primarily bilingual or framed still in the dominant language English and the Western worldview and those types of ways of expression and thought. The, material, the technology used as well was very costly um, and involved considerable amounts of time to create. And there was also a large digital divide um, between those who had access to internet and the hardware or software required um, and who could also afford the costs of being online. So moving forward now to the web 2.0 and 3.0 eras from 2005 to the present day, web, web 2.0 is characterized by increased user participation and collaboration and we're all familiar with this, faster broadband speeds, peer-to-peer -peer sharing and creation, social media, Facebook, YouTube, and the smartphone. Web 3.0, however, is viewed as having even more increased user creation and cooperation, and also importantly, a decentralization and a localization of power. Examples here include blockchain, uh, geolocation, virtual reality, and artificial reality. These two periods um, have involved crossover elements and interplay. What I mean by that is examples from Web 2.0 exist today, such as Facebook, YouTube, and also Web 3.0. So there's, it's complex. It's not so linear or siloed. What this era has enabled it has, um, oh, sorry, what this era has enabled it is informal, formal, and self-directed language and cultural learning opportunities such as land-based planning activities, information about hunting, fishing, and other traditional economic activities for indigenous communities. Example of this is Siku, the Inuit knowledge wiki and social mapping platform app. And in Asia, Southeast Asia, eToro, um, under the control of the Pinan indigenous community uh, stores traditional botanical knowledge. And here, Winter and Bajo, um, using their quote here, these examples connect youth and Indigenous elders to help promote intergenerational knowledge transmission, so not only language, but knowledge, all the while encouraging language revitalization. Um, there has also been more collaborative and multimodal uh, examples, so just put these on the screen here. Um, Mal Pasmaquoddy Maliseet Language Portal, Kobe Learn app, so many apps that have come about, um, Toksuk, 
at first voices I mentioned before, they also have come up with a more recent keyboard app where you can type in over 100 indigenous languages on any social media app. And all of these examples are low tech, mid tech and high tech technology, depending on the community needs and the learning context. So key some, some insights here starting to emerge. Indigenous communities have gone beyond just being recipients of information to also being collaborators or to being internet producers as well as creators. There has been more control and self-determination over the content produced and created. And this self-determination step is necessary to decolonize the digital landscape move away from that universality, Western worldview, English dominated digital landscape to ensure that indigenous voices, languages and worldviews are also represented and privileged online in a culturally relevant way. And here's just a, a, a table from the article that I mentioned with some more examples of apps, websites, movies, songs, video games, social media, coding, digital archives, and virtual reality, artificial reality, and artificial intelligence. Um, all of these are examples of indigenous-led self-determined initiatives as well, not externally set or defined. So some more key takeaways from the present day era. Dramatically more inexpensive than the previous era, um, and the barriers to entry have been considerably, considerably reduced. The digital divide begins to narrow, although some people in remote communities may not have full access in terms of broadband, many indigenous youth now have access to a cell phone, a smartphone as well. So the digital divide is beginning to narrow. Indigenous peoples also no longer need to rely on government or external funding as many initiatives can be started from within the home community using things like cell phone, laptop, iPads, um, social media, TikTok videos, things like that. So Indigenous peoples are decolonizing the digital landscape and are breaking habits of algorithmic, linguistic and technological colonization. Important to note here, some may assume that Indigenous languages are quote unquote under-resourced due to textual speech data or lack of quote unquote standardized language. However, Bird remarks that this is a colonizing frame and assumes that major Western languages are the standard bearers and indigenous languages need these standard technologies or, and or need to be standardized to access or to be part of the digital landscape. However, the goal for many or some indigenous communities or languages may not to be, may not to be fluent or to get fluent level, level of attainment or to have a standardized language form or to have things like Siri or Alexa or spell checkers or autocorrect. And what I mean by that is even having a dictionary online can be an important entry point and raise the prestige of the language and be very crucial for language reclamation and revitalization as a starting point. And that's going to look very different for Indigenous languages compared to languages that are already privileged online, such as English, French, Spanish, German. So more research needs to be carried out by or with Indigenous peoples on how Indigenous peoples view and use technology, what purpose this serves and has served, and whether or not this impacts on day-to-day -day language use, and also promotion of cultural identity. Again, here I'm stressing that it's not just looking at language, per se, but also cultural aspects, com raising community capacity as well. So more many technology enabled and self-determined initiatives have been centering community needs, not externally defined or set goals, such as grammatical fluency or a digitally quote unquote thriving status, because that may not be feasible in the immediate short term, um, compared to other languages, like I mentioned before, where there is already access um, and resources available. Technology use that is responsive to the local community, indigenous community can foster more ethical relationships and relational technologies going forward. And here I'm just going to touch on a little bit about what I mean by relational technology. The role of technology since 1989 that I hope to 
illustrated just briefly in this talk today, has grown and evolved in a short space of time from 1989 from an extension of dominant Western hegemonies to one in which Indigenous peoples have an active and important voice in how technology is used, envisioned and created. However, big questions on data sovereignty, for example, will always have to be asked before copy pasting technology into Indigenous language vitalization initiatives. So to be relational technology, we need to ask these questions. Which system of knowledge is being privileged? Where is this information or knowledge coming from or being stored? Who has the power to access the knowledge and create streams of knowledge transmission? The social use of technology for Indigenous languages is also not considered as a substitute for face-to-face -face learning or interaction and, and not as a panacea or a one-size-fits-all solution. To, however, technology can be in relation to existing and future initiatives, a means to reclaim pride in Indigenous languages and cultures, and importantly, a way for existing and future speakers to learn from each other and to have the space to interact. As with face-to-face -face interactions, the relationships that we all have with friends, family, or just new acquaintances, the intent behind that and the relationship that we build will determine what impact technologies present and future use will have. Implica and there's also implications for technology use for dominant languages such as English and French, just by asking the same questions, which knowledge system are you upholding? Whose knowledges and expertise are being privileged? And just as I'll come towards the end of this talk, I'm just going to touch on an example of online community led language reclamation using technology. This is from my doctoral work, where um, I call this a technology pilot project, tech for traditional ecological knowledge and technology here. That's what technology stands for. And it's just some screenshots here of videos we created. So this is an indigenous elder here, Barbara Nolan, um, speaking in the language and interacting there. And we used emojis, uh, it was fully immersive in Anishinaabemwin. So this work was carried out with my husband's community uh, here on Turtle Island, looking at how technology could be helpful in the revitalization and reclamation of Anishinaabemwin or Ojibwe. Um, and these videos are now hosted on YouTube um, for community members and um, wider community to access as well. And here's another screenshot here of interacting, having conversation with the dog uh, Fairy here. And Babitoon, um, that's, uh, let's give the dog a cookie um, using emojis here to enforce and convey meaning through technology. So some concluding remarks here. Technology can be helpful for Indigenous language maintenance, reclamation and revitalization. However, it's not a one size fits all, quote unquote, universal approach that needs to be taken. Local bottom up perspectives need to be at, in the creation process and involved in the co-creation process alongside universal approaches. So what I mean by that is bottom up and top down approaches here. There is still a digital divide as well, so that, that we also need to work on that and making and ensuring that indigenous communities do have access to digital and online technologies. Um, and as I mentioned before, top-down support, governmental support, ex things like that needs to be informed by the community. And, and indigenous languages cannot just be relegated to being "quote unquote" informal domains. There needs to be it needs to be both. Um, here, I just want to stress the importance of Indigenous self-determination. Um, are the community asking for the technology? What are they asking for? And um, not going in assuming that technology is going to be, again, a one-size-fits-all or a panacea. So we're looking at transferability, what could be applied, not generalizability here. So technology's role at every stage for relational technology needs to be decided and led by the community members themselves. And that is also to safeguard data sovereignty. Where is the data going to be stored? Who's going to get access to it? And this is to also to safeguard against extractive research and extractive researchers. So researchers who want to work with indigenous and minoritized communities to enable relational technology need to position themselves and self-locate themselves. Why are you working on this project? Why are you 
coming in here to a mar marginalized or minoritized community. So it's important to position as well to enable relational technology. Um, more another conclusion, a concluding remark here, the trans transmission of worldviews, indigenous knowledges and languages needs to be immersive and also in context. So the elder and the project that I just showed before stressed this as well, that the learning immersion is a way to go when we're looking at indigenous language revitalization. How can technology do that? And what I've been finding on my project is the use of emojis, the stickers have been helpful in conveying meaning, especially for younger learners who actually like these kind of interactive things as well. Um, so more community-led research following community protocols is required. So that's what's going to give more impetus to what relational technology looks like going forward. What are the community uh, looking for? What, are, what do the community define as language? And what do the community define as relational technology? So conclusion here, some questions for you to carry forward or we can even discuss a little bit today. I'm not sure how much time we have. What lens are you coming from? in terms of looking at work using technology, language revitalization, indigenous languages, endangered languages, minority languages, min minoritized languages. What is your relationship with technology? Have you thought about it? What is that, is that, does that question seem strange and why does it seem strange? What, do you see yourself having a relationship with technology? Or if, So that's another question here and here. How is community expertise empowered through the use of technology? And those are just three questions for, for all of us here to ponder and to carry forward into the future. So Tapalif, thank you in Gaelic and Miigwech, thank you Nishna Benwin for listening. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think as we went to, <clears throat> along some people have joined us sorry i'm going to stop the recording now so people can put the cameras on so um